Hello, good afternoon everybody. Um, thank you very much for joining our Strategic Dairy Farm webinar today. I'm Kate Harris, Knowledge Exchange Manager at AHDB down in the Southwest. I'm joined today by the Tucker family from Ditchett's Farm in Devon, who are now in their third year as a Strategic Dairy Farm host. So good morning to you all. Whilst ideally we'll be having this meeting on farm today, Unfortunately, due to the ongoing situation with COVID-19, we are instead relying on modern technology. Today, we are also joined by my colleague, David Ball, who is our Buildings and Environment Specialist. Good morning, David. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, um, so, I'm so I'm sure some of you probably will have met David before uh, at previous meetings. David, would you mind just telling everyone what you do within AHDB? Okay, good. Uh, thanks, Kate. Yeah, morning, everyone. Uh, my name's David Ball, uh, and I'm a member of the environment team here at AHDB. Uh, my area of work focuses around farm infrastructure and uh, manure management, uh, primarily uh, on dairy farms, uh, but including uh, the new regulations relating to air quality and ammonia emissions. Brilliant. Thank you very much, David. So just while we're waiting for everyone to join, and before we move on to a little bit of housekeeping, you'll see on your screen an audience poll asking you a question about the main type of cow housing that you have. If you could please click on the option that applies to you, it will give us a good insight into our audience listening in today. I think we've had a fair number of responses come through so far. I'll give you a few more seconds to finish. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. So you should all now be able to see the results of that. And it, it's I'm actually quite surprised by the results. 42% um, of people have cubicles, but 31% have no housing at all. Um, so I'm really pleased that you've joined us today um, to listen to what the, the Tucker's family and David have got to say. So for those of you who do have cubicles, if you have any photos that you would like to share with us, um, I'll be sharing my email address a bit later on. Just a little bit of housekeeping before we continue. Um, all attendees are muted throughout. If you do have any questions or comments for the Tucker family or for David today, please do use the chat function on your screen. So if you click on the arrow in the orange box, that will expand the chat. Feel free to type in here any time during the session. Don't feel that you have to wait until the end. Your questions won't be displayed to anybody else and whatever we read out will be anonymous. If we can't answer your question today, we will get back to you at a later date. If you're a Dairy Pro member, please do type your name, farm name and membership number into the chat box and this will register you for Dairy Pro points today. The webinar will be recorded and available on YouTube, and we plan to finish by 1 p.m. If you do experience any technical difficulties, my only real advice to you is to turn off and turn back on again. In a moment, Richard Tucker will be giving us a brief overview and update from Ditchett's Farm with a short video. We will give you an overview of the farm's current infrastructure and then move on to talk a bit about some proposed investments, focusing largely on cow housing and slurry storage. Before we do that, I'd just like to take a minute to update you on our strategic dairy farm programme. There are now 16 strategic dairy farms in place. We had hoped to have 25 by the end of this year, but obviously uh, our plans have been hampered slightly by COVID-19. The farms are a cross-section of block carving and all year round systems and we do encourage farmers to attend meetings and compare their own figures with that of our system specific KPIs or key performance indicators. We hope to be launching the next group of strategic dairy farms in the autumn and I'm really pleased to announce that we do have a new all year round strategic dairy farm in Devon joining us soon. I encourage you to visit the Farm Excellence page of the AHDB website. You'll find more information about all of our host farmers, including the Tuckers, and links to a range of resources specific to each system. 
we have a new web-based KPI Express calculator, which will provide farmers and those supporting their businesses to be able to measure up to nine different KPIs, both technical and financial. We will send you a link to this and a follow-up email after this webinar. So welcome, Richard, to you and your family. Yeah, morning, Kate, how are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, we're just going to show a short bit of film to give you a feel for Ditches Farm, seeing as we can't all be there today. And whilst that is playing, Richard will give you an overview. Um, please just bear with us a second while we upload the video. Need like a backing track or something, don't we, while this is up on some like music. Mm -hmm. Okay, Richard, over to you. Uh, good morning, everybody. I um, hope you're all keeping safe and well. Um, it's glad you could all join us this morning. Uh, yeah, here's um, a little video. Took got a bit creative with the drone the other day, sort of a little panning around our farm here at Ditches Farm Tiverton. Um, it's all rented farm um, off a of private landlord. Uh, yeah, we're currently milking um, 220 crossbred cows, 500 kilo cows, off um, a 64 hectare platform with um, runoff for. Um, silage and for young stock as well we do raise a few extra young stock as well just sort of tv insurance and a few surplus around that are quite good um currently we're all co-op members and we are um doing sort of just over five and a half thousand liters per cow sort of averaging sort of four and a half butter fat and 3.6 protein uh yep yeah, so sort of this year we're sort of standard calf 7th of february um we were 82 or so percent carved in six weeks which is pretty good um, um sort of it's been one of those sort of years really um sort of grass growth wise february was really wet um and then it comes sort of um dry march april we got quite dry sort of during mating so that's sort of forced quite a bit of supplementary feeding um and then we sort of had the rains in june and early july and that sort of led to a bit of a flash and um, we ended up making a bit more surplus then so what was quite a desperate sort of well not desperate but sort of a a forest situation uh, deficit at that time sort of we're now sort of with what we've had in the autumn we're looking at looking to be fairly set up for the winter and i dare i say it post 2018 forage stock levels um so yeah here we, sort of this is what you can see here is the sort of top end of the platform looking back towards tiverton um this video is actually taken um just at the end of august so we're sort of just coming out of a little bit of a dry spell here um and yeah and we're um sort of back to where we are so we we haven't really done any um pd'ing yet but initial signs look pretty good going forward um yeah and we're looking looking have an interesting sort of chat about um some future infrastructure things going forward back to you flight controller harris thanks richard that's great <laughs> so it's been a while since we've been able to visit ditch it for a meeting can you just tell us a little bit more about what's been happening on the farm since the winter yeah, so this year um, we did actually, before lockdown arrived, we'd sort of had in plans in place for sort of a few years now um, to sort of update the, the calf rearing housing. Um, it had been very disjointed in an old sort of um, little places here, there and everywhere. So it wasn't wasn't ideal. The ventilation wasn't great in some of the little sheds and it was, it was pretty demanding labour wise. Um, and we sort of, what you can see in front is, is what we, um, what we, built we knocked down sort of two smaller buildings and then put this purpose built shed up um it actually arrived just before um just before lockdown the shed was on the ground so it worked quite well that they could actually the builders could actually get on and build that this spring stroke early summer and um yeah and it should should hopefully should revolutionize calf rearing as well so they're all in one place um well sort of specifically designed shed for it um it will get it's probably be the most used shed on the farm i think to be honest um with um 
we do we've got a geese enterprise as well so that starts sort of end of april early may and then these until christmas and then um we've got the sheep as well that that's sheep so you can learn them in um january so i kick them out at the beginning of february when there's some calves arrive um so yeah it, it's been up and down sort of season but yeah you just got to deal with it really if you've got sort of um numbers in place where you need to be as to regards of feed requirements and average pasture covers and you just got to deal with it um it's almost it's almost decision wise almost easier not having any grass because you know you've got a feed then that's when you've got surplus you've got to sort of takes a little bit more managing so to speak um so yeah um bottom of the picture is the parlor um you can't quite see it just about with a feed bin um that was um that was put in in 2005 by um that looks 2005 so 2006 that was by mum and dad that was before i came home so that was sort of the very big sort of the the, the turning point investment really um it was refused by the bank and we had to go to private mum and dad went to private um finance companies to finance it um and as sort of the picture doesn't really do it justice here but we're on quite a slope really um the back corner of the big shed is pretty much underground we had to dig into it that much um and when we actually did the parlor or mum and dad did the parlor the, there was a contingency budget in it to buy extra cows um but that was actually um used up to sort of drains out because when they started digging in of course they found water then and then it, it got soaked up into it um so that sort of spearheaded the growth of the business really um and then we sort of went through a range of um because we're all tenanted obviously um just the capital was was our sort of limiting factor so to speak um as regards to sort of big investment um we went through a range of um out wintering um fodder beat um we still do with the, with the young calves as well the r1s they're out on kale in the winter but we went through a range of fodder beet. worked really well but we just sort of ran out of ground that's sort of favorable to the to sort of that that sort of cropping uh and sort of the issues we got so it's, it's a great crop fodder beet. can't really knock it um from that point of view and the, the cattle look really well on it but just a bit muddy and we just got to be a little cautious of soil erosion and we were, were sort of limited to sites that we could do it in our sort of proximity to Tiverton and and sort of water courses and roads and things was, was a bit of a limit there um yeah then we so went through that, a range that of... new shed richard sorry i yeah, right be there the new the new shed you put up in the top left hand corner that was built in 2015 is that correct yeah, I think that's officially my hurry up um, by Kate to get me back on point. But yeah, no, we built that in 2015. We um, we did, we actually, just to finish the story about winter, we actually sent them, we went a couple of years away sending cattle away on bed and breakfast, dry cows away on bed and breakfast in the winter. Because um, we do have, we dry off just before Christmas. Um, so we do have sort of six, eight weeks with everything dry. Um, yeah, this, the big shed, 2015, um, we went initially with Loose House. We looked at a couple of sheds similar to it. Um, capital sort of restricted what we what we could have done else extra with it but it worked works well it's allowed us to um increase stock numbers it works as a feed pad to feed on the shoulders of the season or the middle of the summer depending on on the last two summers with um drought and stuff uh and yeah it's worked worked pretty well it's done us a job um uh we, we probably we had one or two cell count issues coming this spring coming from the winter um Potentially might be a little bit to do with loose housing, teat sealant, hard to prove, um, but yeah, various sort of causes for that. Um, but yeah, no, we're looking sort of just moving forward a bit really um, to sort of add some cubicles, make sure that we're investing and going forward um, with obviously with slurry storage and just sort of the way the sort of milk contracts are going, like cloud cow cleanliness and welfare and everything's real, real top priority. So just sort of trying to make sure we're, we're ahead of the curve with all that and um yeah that's sort of the direction that we're going in and, and to be honest the biggest driver is actually workload um loose housing is great loads of straw and there's brilliant but it takes a lot of time and it takes quite a lot of managing as well like poor old dad spends most of his time blowing straw in the winter and during the spring as well so actually if we could get a well-managed cubicle house that's sort of a lot easier to manage even even dare i say robotic scrapers in there to to eliminate some of the workload um then it's going to be a lot more easier going forward sort of taking the business forward people working for us um trying to be an employer of choice and even dare i say take on another unit we can just step back and yeah so we've got something nice and easy to run if that makes sense
Brilliant. So just the photos we have up now. So top left, you've invested quite heavily in tracks in the last few years to help out with some lameness issues you've had. A better picture yep. of the parlour down the bottom. And then the top right, obviously, is your your loose uh, loose housing with the feed pad outside. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, tracks um, top left. Uh, yeah, we white line was a big issue for us. Sort of it was we we made a lot of tracks out of our own stone, and um, that was fine when numbers were small. We start pushing numbers on it, cow numbers on it, then sort of traffic gets a bit more, a bit more, and then we ended up having quite a lot of white line issue. Um, we actually bit the bullet and concreted some of this where you can see in the picture. Um, real high traffic use that gets a lot of tractor use as well. Um, the rest of it was sort of done with a base stone and, a, and a sort of a scalping on top, which works really well. I'm really pleased with that. Um, yeah, the feed pad of the shed, we feed inside and outside, um, created with an electric wire to keep them off the outside. Um, yeah, and we can we can feed all cows inside and outside. It works 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 well from that point of view. Yeah. I learned the feed bins never went in to start with, but we put them in a couple of years ago as well. Brilliant, that's great. Thank you very much. So you have already mentioned that you are potentially looking at putting some cubicles in. Obviously, that throws up then the issue of slurry storage as well. Um, am I correct in saying as well that there's probably not any opportunities really to expand or extend this shed? Um, yeah, we sort of, as I sort of mentioned earlier, sort of to the uh, left of the the, the shed. Um, that's pretty much underground really um, and then to the right of the shed that's pretty much sort of built up ground a bit really um, we were digging quite a bit we had to move quite a bit of um, um, stuff to um, to sort of um, get the site level we set it up level four cubicles that was always the intention but we don't we're sort of limited we've got 64 hectares we can access grazing um, and apart from a few potential hectares sort of at the Tiverton end of the, of the farm um, we've got a, the whole town is there, so that limits expansion that way. You go to the other end of the platform, then we're only sort of one field away from about 200 acres of woodland. And then we've got the main road just to sort of the bottom of that picture. That sort of limits us that way. And then the other way, yeah, it's not, we're, um, we're sort of limited there with sort of topography as to, so setting up for sort of 220 cows here, that sort of it. And then, yeah, it might be somewhere else then we'll move. I'll find somewhere about another place to expand a bit further but yeah that's sort of the limit we've got here so it's always bearing in mind sort of expansion plans but I think we're sort of there here sort of secret. Brilliant thanks Richard that's a really good overview. David um, if I could come to you now that's a really important point though isn't it that any long-term investment that you make on farm does need to make allowances for possible ex future expansion. Uh, yes, indeed, uh, Kate, it does. And uh, this sort of investment is uh, generally a once in a lifetime, once in a generation um, uh, investment. Uh, so taking account of where the business might be in the in the near future or even the, the medium term is uh, is a wise decision when it comes to these sorts of investments. And just um, moving on, David, do you want to just give us um, a little bit of information about space requirements looking at the Tucker's current shed setup? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, there's one, of, one of the advantages of uh, installing cubicles is, is of course, that the, because the space requirements for loose house cows are greater, uh, then uh, more animals can be accommodated in a given shed. Uh, and we can see here on the screen the red tractor requirements for uh, this size of cow. Um, it does mean that the shed that Richard's got there at the moment is um, uh, able to house his 220 cows comfortably within the space requirements. Uh, but with cubicles installed, there is uh, a little bit more opportunity to keep more cows should he wish. Uh, and so you can see from the slide there, the space requirements um, allow for 240 cubicles uh, to be installed in this in this shed. Brilliant, thank you David, sure. that's great. So just to let everyone know that in a few minutes we'll be allowing a little bit of time to answer some of your questions, so please do type them in the question box. So David, in addition to space requirements, um, what would you say are the other main considerations for the Tucker family to consider when looking at putting in cubicles? Um, well, other than the space requirements for the cow, of course, uh, for lying, um, if you want to move the slide on, Kate, there, there's some other considerations there, feed space. 
space for the cows to eat is another consideration. And uh, you can see the uh, um, um, amount there based on this size of cow for simultaneous feeding or ad lib feeding. Uh, so it's important to allow enough space for feed and likewise water, often overlooked, uh, but the water requirement uh, would be about uh, 100, 100 millimetres of water trough space per cow or to allow 10% of the herd to drink at any one time. So feed and water is, uh, is obviously important and access to those uh, may be uh, stated the obvious that, that cows need good access to feed and water. Uh, but it easily um, uh, hampered if uh, the layout of the shed means that uh, getting access to the feed trough, for example, is, is, is a convoluted route uh, that could easily be blocked by other cows, for example. So it, it's, um, it may be an obvious thing to say, but good access to the feed and water is important. Um, uh, other things to consider of uh, ease of handling cows, separating cows, grouping cows, uh, it's all about the sort of layout of the cubicles and uh, to allow that to happen. Obviously, the cubicle itself needs to provide the cow with a dry, well-cushioned uh, lying surface, comfortable bed to lie on, and it needs to be suitable, uh, the dimensions of it need to be suitable for that particular cow. Obviously, cow sizes range depending on the breed and the breeding and the system. Uh, and so one size doesn't necessarily fit all. Um, so cubicle dimensions need to be appropriate for the cow and they need to include that lunging space in the front of the cubicle to make it easier for the cows to get up and down. So that wants to be at least 700 millimetres of lunge space at the front end of the cubicle. Uh, supplying the number of cubicles, we mentioned there's room for 240 in this shed, but there, there needs to be at least one usable cubicle per cow, ideally a 95% uh, stocking rate to allow uh, options for the cow to, to lie down. This will impact her, her lying times if there are uh, insufficient cubicles and uh, she spends more time stood on, her, stood on her feet looking for something to lie down or waiting for her herd mates to move on. Uh, option for bedding, that's another consideration. Uh, and. Uh, <laughs> The slurry system may well uh, dictate uh, the, the bedding options. Um, sand is obviously one that's um, favoured by many, uh, but doesn't suit all slurry systems. So whatever whatever bedding material is, is, is um, chosen, uh, there needs to be a ready supply of it uh, in order to uh, ensure that there, there's a, a continuation of that supply. Thanks, David. Uh, so, Richard, have you had any thoughts about your preferred bedding options? If you do go for cubicles, uh, yeah, we. It's like one of the one of the number of questions that sort of starts getting brought up in it when you start thinking about these sort of things. Yeah, um, sort of sand seems to be pretty pretty popular amongst a lot of people um, from an animal welfare point of view, uh, but I'm kind of not kind of shying away from it a little bit as toward as just sort of. Um, handling the slurry really and sort of getting it back out again um and sort of long term is it sort of is it going to be feasible to be start importing sand from from somewhere else i'm not sure so we're um probably looking at um mattresses with um with some sort of bedding on the top i think probably sawdust or, or lime based it'll be interesting to hear what um what other people use and how they sort of get on whether sort of chopped straw rape straw or, or sawdust how them how they get on with those different sorts of things so Comments in the box would be really helpful. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. That'd be great. Uh, David, um, any thoughts on bedding options from you? Um, yes, yeah, so there are various things to consider with uh, with bedding. And uh, as Richard uh, said, the sand is is a is a sort of favourite one for cow comfort uh, and uh, and disease control, perhaps, uh, but doesn't suit every system. So um, if if you wanted to move on a slide, please, Kate. Yep, I, just while we're doing that, I've had a quick question come in. Um, what period are the cows housed for over winter, Richard? Uh, typically, we'd only be um, sort of mid-November to sort of early February would be the time that, when we sort of keep them in. We, um, But yeah, it might, it might vary a little bit if the weather's not great in February or, or end of sort of October, early November. Yeah, but that would sort of be our three months would be sort of the planned winter period, if you know what I mean. Brilliant. Over to you, David. 
Okay. All right. Thanks, Kate. Um, yeah, so looking at the, the bedding options, um, one of the things that Richard mentioned was about the uh, straw requirement and, uh, and getting hold of that. Um, and there's a comparison there on the screen of uh, typical uh, uses of various beddings per cow for the three month housing period that we've just uh, talked about. So uh, uh, open yards, straw yards, loose housing, uh, you're going to look at about 1.8 tonnes of cow for that three month period. Whereas if you're chopping a straw and put it onto a cubicle mat, it's much reduced yeah. volume of straw required. Uh, Salt loss on the mat would be about 90 kilos of cow for that three month period. Uh, and sand about 1,450 kilos uh, per cow. Uh, of course, sand is a much denser product, so the, uh, uh, the density, the weight of it is, is more so. Um, so th there's, a, there's an advantage of, uh, of cubicles uh, that the bedding requirement is much less. Uh, and if that's a, an issue on, on some farms, then uh, uh, that's a big consideration. Um, I also uh, think it's easier to control uh, environmental mastitis. Uh, Richard mentioned about the cell count problem, uh, and that's notorious in a, in a uh, loose house, deep litter uh, type of shed. Um, Well-managed cubicles can, uh, can provide that clean bed for the cow. Uh, the other thing that Richard mentioned was the, um, the workload, uh, looking for a simpler system, less demanding on workload. And uh, I think cubicle systems can do that if um, they lend themselves to automation uh, better, perhaps, than loose housing. The higher stocking rates uh, per square meter, we've mentioned that already. Um, uh, and the easier, it can be easier to control the distribution of the herd uh, in the lying area. So that's grouping cows into, into various production groups, dry cows, milking cows, etc. cetera. And, uh, and of course, there's a reduced effect on the uh, high traffic areas. Um, loose housing cows have to walk backwards and forwards to cross the bedding in order to get out to the feed at the front uh, uh, where with a cubicle system that's done on uh, hard surfaces concrete passages but of course there, as always, there are disadvantages um, and that is a, a capital cost of course there's a cost of these cubicles over and above uh, what would be installed in an open shed uh, and the associated slurry storage uh, is obviously another investment that's required and uh, there's also a possible increased risk of injury with because of all the infrastructure within the shed and the uh, and the concrete passages so there's just a few uh, pros and cons uh, uh, associated with cubicles and no doubt uh, there'll be there'll be more thank you david that's great and i know that you've produced a plan which hopefully everyone can now see on the screen as to how you think that cubicles might fit into the shed yeah, that's a that's a possible layout uh, given the dimensions of the shed and the dimensions of, of the cubicles that would be required for this uh, this type of cow, uh, and uh, so that that um, will provide 243 cubicles, I believe, in there. Uh, but it allows for grouping the cows into into three groups or uh, dividing the shed into thirds, a third and two thirds, perhaps depending on the uh, state of the calving season, uh, and the um, uh proposal to put in a uh slurry channel highlighted in pink there uh, across the shed through the existing slurry pit which is already in the shed and out through to a, a possible slurry store so the, the the passages will be scraped either either uh manually with a with a tractor or uh, can be automated into that slurry channel uh water troughs their position to provide the 100 millimeters per cow of water space feed trough at the front there being uh, ability to feed on both sides of that uh, to give them the 600 millimeters of feed space required and uh, and it just it, it, it's very good planning Richard, that you've managed to uh, construct a loose house shed that fits very nicely uh, into cubicles that's great thank you very much david um We've got quite a lot of questions coming in, so we're just going to move to a few of those questions. So a question for you, David. Um, is going to a cubicle-based system likely to lead to greater ammonia issues? Ah, uh, yes, good question. Yeah, there are um, uh, potentially more ammonia emissions going to be emitted from a hard 
surface from a, a, a you know cubicle passages or concrete passages between cubicles I should say um, so that that then becomes an emitting surface once it's got slurry on it um, frequency of scrape, scraping can help with that uh, Richard mentioned the possibility of maybe a robotic uh, scraping system so frequency of scraping would reduce the ammonia emissions um, but they would be greater potentially than a loose house system um, but it's all ne not necessarily about ammonia. Uh, there would be other considerations. Uh, uh, there would be a higher uh, rate of methane emitted from uh, FYM, from straw yards. So there's a, there's a little bit of a swings and roundabouts. Thank you, David. That's really helpful. So we have had a lot of questions coming in around slurry. Um, the second part of the webinar is going to be focusing on that. So I'm hoping we'll be able to answer some of your questions in that. A question for you, Richard. Where on the farm will you be carving the cows if you put cubicles into this shed? Uh, yeah, thanks, Kate. Yeah, we actually have a, um, a separate um, carving shed that um, are currently full of straw at the minute. So we use the straw up to bed the cows and then um, that frees up some space to carve some cows in that shed. So, yeah, it, the shed will be will be primarily for either dry cows or milking cows. It'll be um, the carving area is separate to it. So, yeah. Brilliant. Another question for you, Richard. Um, have you thought about how you're going to train cows to cubicles? Um, yeah, well, they seem to take, we do actually have the young stocker on, um, have some access to cubicles and, and they, when, before they calve in as maiden heifers, um, and they seem to sit in them really well. Um, and when we actually sent them away on bed and breakfast a few years back, they were on cubicles then. Um, and they had very little issues with them. I, I think any, I don't think we brought any back actually that wouldn't lie in the cubicles. Um, so they, they seem to take like it to a duck to water. So as long as they're comfortable and the right size for them, then I don't see it being an issue. But others might say have, a, have different experiences. I don't know. Thank you very much. Thanks both of you. Um, we're going to move on now to the, the section on slurry, but do please keep your questions coming in. So Richard, um, I know you have spent quite a bit of time weighing up your options when it comes to slurry storage. What are the main considerations for you guys to think about? Um, yeah, it's obviously it, yeah, it's the big big thing in it is to sort of look after it and make sure we've got adequate sort of storage capacity and how it's going to fit in with our system. Um, we got a number of um, we're we're a rented farm, so we've also got the landlord to um, to sort of keep happy um, and make sure they're on board with what we're planning. Um, and then a sort of the location as well, really. Um, we're we're pretty close to a main road. Um, we've got another property um, pretty close to the the building, so sort of finding somewhere for to um, dig a big lagoon would be would be a challenge, really, um, for what we were sort of thinking and. And, and we were trying to sort of do away with sort of pumping slurry and using and using gravity to move it from the um, store to the from the cubicles to the store, if you know what I mean. Um, and the sort of couple of options was one sort of right behind the house, but that wasn't going to um, be overly overly um, popular with the landlord or, or mum and dad didn't want to look out the bedroom window and have a stinking great big slurry store in front of you. Um, so yeah, we sort of got a few thoughts. Um, probably not the cheapest option but I think they fit in a bit more practically with sort of the, the rest of the farm and, and how it's sort of and also sort of having access to it so we can get the slurry away to um to sort of silage ground that is that is sort of down the lane and up the main road if you know what I mean so making sure we can we've got access to to, to get rid of it as well or use it effectively. So lots and lots to think about. David can I come to you now have you got any advice for the tuckers when looking at slurry options? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, there's um, there's lots to think about, obviously, when the, when you're looking at uh, investing in slurry storage. And uh, the first place to go, of course, is the rules and regulations and, and what you're required uh, to meet. And uh, uh, the first one would be the, the planning authority, because planning consent is in inevitably going to be required for this sort of work. So a planning application will be needed. Uh, the environment agency would need to be notified. Uh, they will be notified by the planning authority anyway, and uh, I'd, I'd recommend um, anyone who's, who's embarking on this sort of project uh, to get in touch with the Environment Agency at the earliest uh, point, 
to get them on board, get some dialogue going with them, get some input from them. Uh, they can be very helpful when uh, trying to plan this sort of, um, sort of project. But uh, there's also the NVZ to consider, and I know the farm buildings themselves aren't in an NVZ, uh, but part of the farm is, uh, and the NVZ areas are a movable uh, target, so they may find themselves in an NVZ at the farm uh, at some point in the future. Uh, and that would require five months of uh, slurry production uh, to be stored uh, in, the, in the slurry store. Uh, SAPO regulations are another one, that's a silage and um, uh, slurry and agricultural fuel oil regs. Uh, they concern mostly with the, with the structure that is to be built and the construction methods and uh, uh, parameters around that. Um, if notwithstanding the NVZ regs, even with, outside of an NVZ area, uh, SAPO regs require four months of storage uh, for slurry production. Farming rules for water are another consideration, uh, particularly the element of those which uh, say that slurry can only be uh, spread on land when there is a crop requirement and when conditions allow, mostly ground conditions, I guess. And uh, so if those, if those restrictions do apply, then you need sufficient capacity to hold the slurry until such time as you can use it on those, uh, uh, on those crops uh, when, it, when it's required. Uh, and and the, the spe in speaking to the Environment Agency, although the regulations say five months for NVZ areas, I do recommend uh, with new structures to aim for a six month storage capacity. Other restrictions that might apply uh, as and Richard alluded to these is the proximity of uh, of houses, roads, uh, water courses, perhaps. Uh, so it's a, sort of a, a more of an amenity consideration uh, and access. Uh, need to get access with slurry tankers, for example, and uh, you don't want to be having to park a slurry tanker in a track where you've got to bring cows in for milking, etc. So access arrangements um, would be another consideration. Okay, Kate, you want, you want to move the slide up? Yeah, okay, thanks for that. We're, we're, so in order to um, calculate the size of storage that's required, uh, we can go through a, a, some fairly simple sums, uh, working out the what slurry is going to be produced by the cows, and uh, Richard's cow number is 220 cows at, uh, at that sort of yield level, house for three months, uh, is going to produce about 832 cubic meters of slurry for that period. Uh, we, we know that the parlour washings uh, are not uh, needing to go into this proposed slurry store because they are dealt with elsewhere, uh, but there is rainfall landing on dirty yards. There's the muck store up at the end of the building and that feeding yard along the front of the building. Um, uh, and those measurements are, are listed there. Uh, and then, of course, there's the rainfall that lands on top of the uh, slurry store itself. Uh, and uh, gives a total area, in this case, of 1113 square metres. So you know, it's going to capture rain that needs to be stored. So we need to know what the rainfall is for that area. And there's a calculation that can be done which converts uh, average rainfall figures into expected rainfall figures. Because um, the average is, uh, as the name suggests, only an average. and uh, Therefore, 50% of the time, uh, you'll get more rain than the average. So you have to be able to accommodate that those wetter average years. Uh, so this M5150 rainfall calculation will convert the average rainfall into uh, uh, that particular rainfall there for the Tiverton area. That gives you the, the, the volume of uh, water that needs to be stored. Uh, and you can see there the, that 652 cubic meters is quite a big slug of uh, liquid compared to the 832 that's going to come out of the back end of a cow. In this case, there's no roof, roof water that goes into the uh, store because that's all uh, diverted away elsewhere. And so the capacity needed for the five month end dead storage requirements is 1484. Uh, the proposed store that uh, that we might talk about in a second or two um, will provide in excess of that. 
So the um, a, a very easy way to uh, to come to these figures and, and work out the, the, the calculated requirement is uh, with the AHGB slurry wizard that's available online and uh, and you can enter the farm specific uh, information in there and it'll do a lot of the calculations to, know, to tell you what the storage requirements are uh, and uh, the capacity that's required and it allows you to play what if what if i put cubicles in my shed uh, how much slurry is that going to produce and how much do i need to store um Moving on uh, to other considerations, uh, uh, the environmental considerations, and in particular ammonia, uh, the government's clean air strategy uh, suggests that uh, by 2027, all slurry stores will need to be covered. So that's a, a, a consideration when investing in new infrastructure, that at some point in the near future, uh, this store is likely to need a cover on it. Uh, there will be uh, environmental permitting by 2025 uh, for all dairy farms that will encompass all environmental regulations. So all those that we spoke of earlier, MV beds, farm rules for water, SAPO, et cetera, et cetera, all those will be wrapped up into an environmental permit that uh, uh, um, dairy farmers will be required to uh, obtain. One or two other environmental issues. Odour is becoming an increasing um, uh, of increasing interest of local authorities when planning applications are submitted. That sometimes um, odour mapping is required to for them to assess the effect in the local area, uh, on local populations, sensitive habitats, etc. Uh, health and safety. Obviously, the, the, the needs to be secure. We don't want people falling into it, uh, and. Uh, Spreading equipment, uh, there will be restrictions on spreading equipment as part of the clean air strategy. By 2025, uh, it has to be placement equipment, um, in other words, splash will be banned. Just going back to, uh, momentarily to the cubicle uh, design and the proposal to put cubicles in, there will be, as part of the clean air strategy, mandatory design standards for new cattle buildings. So uh, this sort of project will after 2025 need to meet these design standards that will be aimed at reducing uh, ammonia emissions. And that will largely be focusing on uh, drainage and clean yards separating liquid from solid. So uh, I think very applicable to this uh, um, farm and, and others as well, of course, is, is to keep it simple. Uh, you can be very comprehensive and have uh, an all singing, dancing, bells and whistles system uh, for slurry um, handling, but it needs to be cost effective, uh, particularly perhaps in a situation where the farm's not owned. You have to be uh, looked at in a cost effective way and it has to be practical. It has to fit in with the farm's system and how they plan to manage the farm. Um, okay, so. Then we're going to have a quick look at the the value of this stuff and help to um, uh, justify the, the use of it. Um, so taking a typical ton of six percent dry matter cow slurry that contains these nutrients: two point six kilograms of nitrogen, one point two of phosphate, and two and a half of potash. So those um, elements, just in terms of N, P, and K, uh, give a value of about three pound thirty a ton for cow slurry. Uh, given today's fertilizer prices. So that's just the N, P, and K. Or to put it another way, each cow will produce the equivalent of 55 kilograms of ammonium nitrate in slurry whilst she's housed for three months. Um, so doing a simple sum uh, with the herd size, uh, the slurry store will therefore contain as much nitrogen as there is in over 12 tons of ammonium nitrate by turning. Now that's a bit of a headline figure uh, to grab your attention, uh, but uh, of course it's not all readily available to the crop uh, as it's up to how that is utilized, how it is stored and how is it utilized in order to try and make use of that nitrogen that's within the slurry. Uh, and there's also a, obviously another a range of other nutrients and organic matter in the slurry that makes it even more valuable than, than the, just the N, P and K. 
So timing and application method are, are critical uh, to make best use of the nutrients. Hence the need to have sufficient storage that you can use the product uh, at its optimum time. David, could I just come in there a second, please? Um, go yeah, back sure. on that slide. Um, it, I always have a bit of issue of like all of a sudden you build a build a slurry store and then all of a sudden you've magicked up 12 tonne of ammonium nitrate from somewhere. Um, I, I'm always of the opinion that that, from a nutrient balance point of view, P and K imported via feeds and however and exported via milk, this, the, that's already in the system. So I haven't got 12, uh, the 12 tonne of AN would still be in my system, but it would be in, in, the, um, in the form of FYM instead of in slurry. Um, but one of the sort of the big sort of things about uh, moving to this sort of system, the concern that I have is, and a limitation is sort of, we we are in mid Devon, the ground's a bit slopey, um, and we use a contractor for for a lot of our muck spreading and slurry spreading. He's going to be less keen to go on some of our slopey ground with a with a slurry tanker than he would be with um with a rear discharge dung spreader on a, on a lighter load. So we're we're going to have to take into consideration. Um, sort of some of the limits on where we can um where we can spread this slurry and, and we've done and our farms already um sort of mapped up from a high risk low risk point of view and we're, we're gonna have to be a bit careful where we spread it because obviously we can we can go lighter loads and on the steep on the steeper banks with with an with fym but perhaps not with slurry so i don't know if you had any thoughts on that david uh, yeah, it's a very good point, Richard. Uh, very good. A uh, couple of points, actually. Um, yeah, first of all, you're not creating uh, nutrients out of thin air. Uh, these are there anyway, and they come out the back end of a can. Whether you store them as slurry or whether you store them as FYM, uh, they're still there. Uh, but it's about the uh, utilization of and the avail availability of those nutrients uh, and how you're able to utilize the nutrients that are within them. Slurry, of course, is a, uh, provides a much more readily available source of nitrogen, so it can be utilized as a, a more of an immediate um, feed for the crop, uh, whereas the uh, FYM, of course, most of the nitrogen is in um, uh, uh, organic matter, which is more slow release. So it's a, it, that's about uh, having a resource and utilize, being able to utilize it to its best extent. Uh, the other point about your um, slopey ground uh, and your risk map is yeah, a very good point in that, in that uh, having got it as slurry, there may be areas of the farm where you're unable to take it because of the risk of runoff or the danger of turning tractors over. Uh, other application methods are available, of course, uh, but if it's slopey ground, uh, and it's on your risk map, then uh, then you're limited then to utilizing the slurry on those other areas. But bear in mind, it is um, a more readily available source of nitrogen that has a more immediate effect on the crop. Thank you, David, that's really helpful. Um, just moving on that, could you give us a bit of a rough idea in, of, of cost of the different options? Um, yeah, sure, these are uh, costs you can see on the screen there. These are typical costs. Obviously, these will vary hugely uh, across the country and dependent on the um, uh, supply and demand, workload of contractors, etc. Um, but these are typical costs and it's more about the relative cost than the absolute. Um, so the, obviously a clay line lagoon is the cheapest, just dig a hole in the ground. Uh, approval is still obviously needed uh, with the planning authority and the environment agency, but it's the cheapest way of uh, creating capacity. Uh, to the other end of the scale, uh, a concrete store, so concrete panels, concrete floor, uh, which is what's proposed here, is, is up around a sort of 40 pound a cubic meter. As I say, this, this is just an indication, Other other um, there will be varied uh, quotes obtainable across the country depending on local conditions. Thanks, David. That's great. And lots of really useful information there. Just to let everyone know that we will send you a link afterwards to the Slurry Wizard, which you'll be able to use with your own figures. So just moving on, Richard. Um, so you've, you've had a thought about how and where you might locate your new slurry store. Do you want to just talk us quickly through that? Yeah, sure, Kate. Yeah, what you can actually see on the picture here is um, yeah, the big sheds to the, to the um, left and the red sort of circle is... Um, that was drawn on. It's not actually. There's not a big red circle in the ground, and it's actually drawn on <laughs> where we're planning on um, putting the store. Um, and that's actually 
we're gonna we were just gonna dig straight down and put concrete panels around um, and create a store sort of 30 odd meters long and I think it was about 13 14 meters wide that sort of fit in there and then it would sort of be backfilled that's quite a, sort of a bank there um, um, and then it should fit in there relatively nicely and be gravity filled um, it's utilizing a bit of waste well, or ground that's not been doing a lot at the minute um, uh, and yeah and it's sort of gravity fed and it's sort of there for relatively easy access for um, tankers to sort of suck out we'll probably end up using contractors to um yeah dribble bar it on or, or inject it on whichever they um they can be um persuaded to purchase um and yeah and it sort of worked and sort of we've got the shed in the middle that of the picture that's sort of what's full of straw at the minute we use that to carve in um that'll be the natural run for um where any sort of if there was anything that happened to in, in the stores and that would um go straight into our existing um dirty water handling system um, so yeah, that's sort of where we're sort of thinking. It's not the cheapest option um, as regards to what was discussed in the previous slide, but I think it works practically, and and it's something that parties are all sort of relatively happy with. Thanks, David. You visited the farm a couple of weeks ago, and you had a look at this. Um, what are your thoughts on this option? Uh, yeah, it seems like a very straightforward option there. Like you, uh, like you said, Richard, to uh, use gravity in a in a channel to um, uh, take the slurry out of the shed, particularly given your restrictions at the ends of the shed, where you are limited in being able to scrape slurry um, out of the end of the shed into into a store. So that slurry channel would take it sideways um, and into that into that proposed uh, location there. Uh, just a just a word of caution there that uh, one thing that the environment agency may want to comment on is the um, contingency for disasters and emergencies. But what happens if the store springs a leak, uh, uh, some failure or other? Uh, uh, where's all the slurry going to go? Uh, and so maybe some bunding around the outside of it. Uh, I know it's uh, the site there does afford that in in sort of three of the four sides, uh, but the other side, a bit of banking, perhaps might just uh, uh, help with that contingency. Yeah, yeah, no, we we sort of consider that sort of thing, David, and just sort of the natural sort of if there was a spillage, it would sort of run out in the sort of top right hand corner of that sort of red blob if you know what i mean and that then would it would run into our exist the, the drains from that yard would then run into our existing dirty water system so yeah we sort of think that's sort of contingency there to sort of catch up so yeah we've um it's something we've um considered as well brilliant thank you to both of you um we have got a few questions coming in um so a question for you david there has been um, a few experiences of slurry stalls being covered, which has then led to a greater odour problem as it turns anaerobic. Are there any other solutions? Um, presumably to covering slurry stores. Is that the is that the question? Is the solution to covering them? Is that the Yeah, the, and, and obviously reducing any then potential odour problems. Well, generally speaking, the um, uh, the digestate that would come out of a digester when the when it's uh, anaerobically being digested, um, the odor odor problems are are reduced uh, from digestate. So um, the odor from a covered store would would be less, and there's also obviously less ammonia coming off that store as well. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Lots of questions coming in for you, Richard, about handling slurry. Would you use a separator to enable longer distance pumping of slurry? I think you've already said um, that you use a contractor. Would you continue to do that? And if so, would you look at sort of low emission methods? Yeah, we, we would stick with using contractors, I think. Um, they've sort of been primed as to sort of this was our plan going forward. and. Um, uh, yeah, we would be looking at low um, mid dribble bar or um or sort of shallow injection. That would sort of be our preferred choice. Um they've got bigger tractors than what we have. We haven't got that big tractors um and they can they can pull the tankers around. Um as regards to sort of separation and pumping, it we sort of did did sort of uh, sort of cross the mind a little bit, but we're very limited as to regards we can pump it. A lot of it would be going across the main road and another back road and then up and down another valley. So we're sort of thinking of pumping it to another to where we're going to do it, it's not going to, where we're going to apply it, it's not going to be particularly feasible. So um, 
yeah, I can I can see the benefits of a separator producing sort of some more fibrous material that we could use on some of the banks a bit more, um, but not imminently is the question is the answer. Another question for you, Richard. Where does your silage effluent currently go? The silage effluent goes into um, into the range of um, underground stores that we have um, in the in the shed already, and also um, to do with the parlour and with the um, the dirty water handling system as well. Thanks, thanks, Richard. David, another question for you. Will there be any grants for slurry or silage storage in the future, especially to support compliance with the clean air strategy? Uh, right, yeah, good question. Thanks for that. Um, there, I believe there it is unlikely that there will be grants available for slurry storage uh, and silage storage, so effectively that's silage clamps. Um, I think that's unlikely that that will be the case. Um, however, there may well be uh, grant aid available for covering uh, slurry stores. These windows open and close now and again. Um, uh, and once it's a legal requirement, there probably won't be any uh, grant aid. So when the opportunity arises, if it does, before it becomes a compulsory, that's the, that's the time to take advantage of that. But it does it does vary across the country depending on the area, uh, whether there's a priority area for uh, catchment sensitive farming and uh, and the government's priorities at the time. Thank you, David. So sorry, just to just to finish on that, the, the, the advice is to watch this space and be uh, uh, alert to the various windows that open up for for grants. Okay, thank you. I've just had a message come through to say apparently there are grants available for slurry stores in Wales for those who are listening from Wales. <laughs> Um, a question for you, Richard, and this is quite a big question, really. How are you justifying the investment? Will you lower your cost of production or increase profit? Yeah, that's the um, that's that's the big one, isn't it? Um, that's what it's all about. Um, yeah, just to going back to the previous one about grants, sort of with the the very area based here, we're not currently in an in an area in a catchment that that supports these sort of covering of yard type grants, but yeah, they might be an option for the future. Um, yeah, this is this is a big thing going forward, and it's it's a bit more about resilience, I think, business resilience, and actually um, having a business that can allow us to step away um, and have other staff involved and and be able to run it and maintain the same level of of profit that we're making now. Um, yes, there will be, I think, we were to utilise some of the nutrients a bit better, so there's going to be, um, I think, there'll be a benefit there. Um, and I think there'll probably be a slight benefit, um, perhaps of people who's been a bit more comfortable and um, will, will probably use them a bit, will probably end up using them a bit more frequently because they are more available. Um, it takes a little bit of time to sort of get all the straw in the yard and everything else. So it's like, oh, we want it out today or whatever. Um, it's a bit damp, so we, we'll, we'll keep them out a little bit. But if it gets too much, we'll, we'll, if we've got the cubicles, we'll bring them in and perhaps, yeah, there's another. 250, 300 kilos of dry matter grown through um, having cows not on pasture when they shouldn't be, um, and then if, if they've got an environment that they're they're um, they're happy and comfortable in, yeah, there might be an increase in output. Um, but yeah, no, that's definitely the big one, and I think the big one for me is actually the improvement in in business resilience and actually um, allowing us to sort of have have a have a business that can maintain its profitability and us sort of walk away or take on other challenges and um without us without there being a threat to um to the sort of to the business i hope that sort of makes sense yeah and i think that's a really good one to finish on we just about run out of time for questions thank you very much to everyone who sent questions in um, and a huge thank you to richard and david for answering those questions um just finally um, before everyone disappears. Um, if you'd like to send in any pictures or ideas to Tucker family, then please do send them in to this email address. Um, we will send an email um, round to everyone who's attended today to direct you to the website and to any information um, mentioned over the last hour. Um, please don't forget to add in your details before you go if you want to collect Dairy Pro points. And we do very much hope that we'll be able to welcome you back to Ditchett's Farm um, in the not too distant future so that we can conclude um, their three years as strategic dairy farm host. 
So that just leaves me to say a huge thank you to the Tucker family for today and for everything they've done so far as a strategic dairy farm host. And a huge thank you to you, David, as well, for joining us. Um, wish you all an enjoyable rest of your day. Hope to catch you all soon. Okay, bye. Bye. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, yeah, I hope you've found it useful. And um, yeah, if you've got any any um, stories of or positive um, stories, then I'm more than interested to hear. So um, yeah, please feel free to get in touch and um, share your um, share your stories. Or yeah, you know, we can discuss this further. I'm more than happy to do that. So thank you very much. Hope you enjoyed it. Thank you.